Memorial Day weekend was, as always, a busy time in Shenandoah National Park. This incredible beauty spot in the heart of Virginia is the perfect place to escape for the long weekend, with cascading waterfalls, fields of wildflowers, and over 200,000 acres of protected lands, you couldn't find a better place to explore the great outdoors. So how did two seemingly well-traveled women who were avid backpackers end up dead at their campsite, with their dog wandering around the national park completely unharmed? People say Ted Bundy didn't show any emotion. I showed emotion. Unit 2, move into position. Units 3 and 4, maintain coverage of Sector 7. I'm not guilty. Hopefully Corporal Bundy will The following episode is not suitable for those under the age of 13. Viewer discretion and parental guidance is advised. Before we delve into this episode, I'd just like to give a massive thank you to the people over at Magellan TV for sponsoring this episode. Magellan TV have been a constant supporter of this channel and other true crime channels, and we really, truly wouldn't be able to make the content that we do without their help make sure you go show them some love and check out their extensive library of interesting documentaries, ranging from true crime, history, science, space, and even nature shows. Magellan TV was created by filmmakers and their producers, alongside talented curators, to ensure that each and every documentary on their service is the most premium you can find. I've recently just watched The Price of Honor, which is a documentary about the murders of two teenage sisters from Louisville, Texas, who were killed in a premeditated honor killing in 2008. I super recommend the documentary, and after you've watched it, I'd love if you could drop a comment on this video or send me a tweet or Instagram DM with your opinions and thoughts. Use the link at the top of the description or the link in the pinned comments to bag yourself a one month free trial to Magellan TV, including all of their 4K documentaries at no extra cost. Now back to this episode. On Sunday, May 19th, 1996, Julie Walters and Laura Winans set off on a backpacking trip in the Shenandoah National Park with their dog, Taj. This trip had been planned by Julie as a way of celebrating her starting a brand new job, a job of her dreams, in just a few weeks' time. Julie decided that they should get out of the house and enjoy more time together before they got dragged back into the working world again. Unfortunately, the pair would set off on this backpacking trip and never return. Julianne Williams, better known as Julie, was born on the 11th of September 1971 in St. Cloud, Minnesota. She was a high achiever and a sports enthusiast. In high school, she won the Minnesota State Double Tennis Championship, and she was well-liked by her peers. Julie consistently achieved high grades and knew that she wanted to continue on to college to further her education which is what she went on to do, studying geology. In college, as part of her studies, Julie traveled to Europe to study the extinction of dinosaurs. Julie also spoke Spanish, which was something that helped her on this trip. She eventually graduated summa cum laude from Carleton College in Northfield as a geologist. Julie was well known to be a very helpful person and someone who was really easy to get along with. Her empathetic and always happy to help personality shine through in her work with the disenfranchised, which included helping migrants and people who were suffering from abuse. After she graduated college, she moved to Richmond, Vermont, and took up a job at a bookstore. She had a bright future ahead of her, and she was excited to live it to the fullest. Laura Winnins was born on the 9th of March 1970 to a considerably wealthy family in Michigan. Laura, better known as Lolly, was always thankful for the family she grew up in, but was quite outwardly 
known for rejecting this privilege that sh her birth had given her. She was an avid outdoors lover and spent lots of her free time exploring her hometown and its surrounding areas. She ended up leaving home right out of high school and enrolled in college in Vermont, excited to get started on her own life path. Eventually, she decided that this college wasn't right for her and she dropped out. She wanted to go and get more life experience before she tried to settle on a college course or life path, kind of like a gap year. A few years later, she had figured out what exactly she wanted to do in life and enrolled in Unity College in Maine. Now at Unity College, she began studying to become a wilderness guide, majoring in outdoors recreation. She realized that she loved the outdoors too much to ever settle into an indoor-based job. She wasn't the kind of person that you'd think would go and have an office job or work like a conventional job. She was definitely like an outdoorsy person and she knew that whatever she wanted to do in her career, she wanted to be outdoors. One journalist describes Laura as being a micro-brew drinking, fish-following, cigarette-smoking, good-time girl. Now, I'm not really sure the connotations or the context behind the good time girl. It doesn't make her sound very good, um, but it's, I think it, it means more that she just liked to have a good time, not that she was a good time girl. Julie and Laura had met two years prior to the camping trip that we spoke about at the start of this episode when they joined Woods Woman in 1994. Woods Woman was a non-profit organization that focused on education and adventure travel for women in the Minnesota area. This organization was known as the grandmother of women's outdoor adventure groups. Woods Woman was one of the first adventure travel companies which was run by women for women. The nonprofit ran from 1977 until 1999 and helped more than 8,000 women and 1,200 children go out and explore the outdoors. It was obvious to everyone who knew Julie and Laura why they were drawn to join this organization. They both had a large appreciation for the outdoors and regularly encouraged people to go out and explore the natural world around them. And that's what the pair did themselves. During their time with Woods Women, the pair explored the lakes of Boundary Waters National Park together, as well as the surrounding areas and forests. Despite their very different backgrounds, the pair could connect through their love of the wild and the outdoors that sat right on their doorsteps. Eventually, they both realized that they didn't want to explore the outdoors with anybody else and confessed their feelings for one another. Relieved that they both felt the same way about each other, they quickly fell into an even easier relationship as girlfriends. They spent most of their spare time traveling and camping in various beauty spots around the United States. Their love of the outdoors and of each other only made all of their time together that extra bit more special. Unfortunately for the pair, one of their camping trips would take a turn for the worse, and it would take days to find out what truly happened to them. Not much is known about what the pair did during the years between them meeting and their last camping trip, but I would likely bet that they spent a large portion of their time camping and hiking together. And when they weren't outdoors, they were probably already planning their next trip. Shenandoah National Park was one of those places that both Julie and Laura wanted to explore. And with Julie landing a new dream job due to start in just a few weeks time, it seemed like the perfect time for them to just get out there and explore. They could disconnect from the world and just be with each other doing an activity that they both loved. Between Sunday the 19th and Friday the 24th of May 1996, Julie, Laura and their Golden Retriever Taj hiked miles within the park. While many people flock to Shenandoah National Park to walk along a part of the Appalachian Trail, that was not the case for the couple. Julie and Laura had decided to not hike the Appalachian Trail and instead just embark on a more off-trail backpacking trip together with their dog Taj. They were exploring one of the park's other famous features, the Skyline Drive. Skyline Drive is a 105 mile route of scenic overlooks, picnic sites, trailheads, and campgrounds. 
which was perfect for people wanting to do longer trails like Julie and Laura. Now, the couple had decided to walk a rough circular route around the Skyland Lodge area of the park, Skyland Lodge being a well-known rest stop, serving as a start and end point for many different trails in this particular area of the park. After a long day of walking, Julie and Laura decided it was time to settle in for the night and pitch their tent. They looked around the area that they were in and settled upon a peaceful spot off the trail which had a mountain stream running past. This spot was just off a bridle path which was in compliance with the park's rules that stated people not camping in the designated campsites were still allowed to erect a tent as long as it wasn't actually on the trail. The area where they decided to camp was quiet. For Julie and Laura, it must have been serene. During the day, you could hear the distant sound of hoofbeats from horses passing on the bridle path, as well as the calming sounds of the mountain stream next to the tent. The sound of this stream would have been a calming addition to the other forest sounds and a background noise to the other walkers in the area. But at night, the sound of the stream would have echoed around the forest and blocked out most other sounds making it one of the only sounds Julie and Laura could hear. The campsite that Julie and Laura created was only a short distance from the Skyland Lodge parking area, less than a quarter of a mile away. On the 31st of May 1996, 12 days after Julie and Laura first embarked on their backpacking trip, Thomas Williams, Julie's father, reported his daughter missing after not hearing from her for days. He had tried to get a hold of Julie to wish her luck before she started her new job on the 1st of June 1996. He stated that, quote, she was going to be starting a new job that was a dream job for her. And he was very proud of her for getting it. He knew that Julie and Laura were going to be going on a camping trip, but he also knew that Julie wouldn't leave herself unprepared to start this new dream job. So when she failed to answer her phone in the few days leading up to when she was due to start this new job, he began to worry. Laura had also promised one of her friends that she would be back from their trip in time to attend her wedding. The last straw for Thomas was when Julie's roommate answered his calls and told her that Julie hadn't packed up or prepared for her new job at all, as if she hadn't even returned. This made alarm bells go off in Thomas's head and he immediately rang the police to report his daughter and her girlfriend as missing. The 31st of May was the weekend after Memorial Day, so the area was busy, flooded with hikers and sightseers. With this larger than normal footfall within the park, the park's rangers were out in force. The rangers patrolled the main areas of the park, ensuring guests could enjoy the beauty of the national park without damaging the nature around them. Once an alert was made to the park rangers about two women potentially being missing in the park, they were quick to arrange a search party. Within a few hours, the couple's car was found in one of the park's official car parks, and a wider search of the surrounding area was issued. The deputy chief ranger at Shenandoah National Park stated that once their car was found, they, quote, started doing hasty searches to cover all of those trail corridors in that general area to see if we could locate them. While looking for Julie and Laura, the park rangers were alerted to a lost dog. The lost dog was found wandering through the park unleashed and was held onto by the group of walkers who had found him until he could be handed back to the park rangers. Rangers later confirmed that this unleashed dog was Taj, Julie and Laura's dog. Finding their dog wandering unleashed but unharmed only increased the urgency of which the rangers searched for the pair. They knew from Julie's father that the girls loved Taj with every ounce of their hearts, so it was worrying that he just was wandering around alone as they didn't like to let him out of their sights, as he wasn't a, a young dog anymore, he was, quite, he was getting on a little bit, so they always liked to keep an eye on him. The next evening, on Saturday the 1st of June 1996, a full day after the pair were reported missing, the park's rangers finally found the girls' campsite. It took the rangers the whole day to find them, as it was like trying to find a needle in a haystack. The couple were following backcountry regulations at the time, which ensured that backpackers had to camp away from designated trails, fire roads, and developed areas. 
While this showed that Julie and Laura were law-abiding and conscious of their impact on the local area, it also made it difficult for the rangers to find their camp. What the rangers found in the camp would stay with them for the rest of their lives. Julie was found 30 to 40 feet away from the tent, close to the edge of the stream. She was gagged with duct tape, which had been wrapped around her head. And when they looked closer, they found that her wrists had been bound together with cloth. She was found laying on her side, half in a sleeping bag with her throat slit open. After finding Julie so out in the open, some of the rangers started sweeping the perimeter of the camp for signs of Laura. But as it would turn out, these perimeter searches were not needed. Laura was found dead, still inside the couple's tent, and was in a similar state as Julie. She was still dressed in her night clothes, her mouth was gagged, her wrists were bound with duct tape, and her throat was slit open. Strangely, when the duct tape gag that was on Laura was tested by forensics, they found that it had previously been used to bind Julie's hands together. The only difference between the pair was that Laura's ankles were bound together and Julie's weren't. Many people at first thought that Laura and Julie's deaths were a result of a sexually motivated attack, but this wasn't the case as neither of the women had any signs of being sexually assaulted, which indicated that this hadn't been sexually motivated. There was also an assumption that the fact the pair were lesbians had a role to play in their murders, that the person who killed them did it purely due to their sexual orientation, a homophobic attack. This was a double murder of perplexing circumstances. The wooded campsite where the girls were found was only a quarter of a mile down the trail from Skyline Drive. It's crazy to think that less than a 10 minute walk from this popular tourist location, two women could be bound, gagged and have their throats slashed and their killer could completely disappear without a trace. But sometime after the 24th of May, 1996, the date that Julie and Laura were last seen, that's exactly what happened. It would seem that even in this idyllic piece of paradise, monsters lurked in the shadows. As just mentioned, the last time Julie and Laura were seen in person was on the 24th of May, 1996, when the couple were helped by a ranger. Julie and Laura were picked up from Hawksville Gap parking lot by a ranger as they had planned to travel to a different area of the park. They decided that the best way to get to this new area would be to be driven. Their own vehicle was too far away. It would take them way too long to walk back there before the sun would set. And the new area that they wanted to explore was just too far to go on foot with the limited daylight that they had left. While with this ranger, they chatted about their future plans in the park and why they were hiking there. Laura explains their situation and the excitement that the pair had about Julie starting her new job. By the end of the drive, the couple had actually extended their wilderness permit for another five days. Their previous permit was set to expire soon and with the encouragement of the ranger, they extended their pass, which allows them to continue hiking and camping in the park. The ranger then drove them to Stony Man parking lot at 5.30 p.m. where they left the ranger and his car and continued on with their hike. At some point between 5.30 p.m. on the 24th of May 1996 and the 1st of June 1996, Julie and Laura were brutally murdered. Because the pair were found outside and as it had been very cold at night, the coroner actually had a lot of difficulty trying to figure out the exact date and time of death. In the end, the coroner estimated that they had died between the 26th and the 28th of May 1996. The primary two questions the investigators had was who had done this terrible crime and how had their attacker or attackers found the girls very out of the way campsite? Had someone just so happened to have stumbled upon their makeshift campsite, or had this been a predetermined attack? The park services waited 36 hours after the discovery of Julie and Laura to announce the murders publicly. The people who were already in the park at the time became very wary of anyone they didn't know, with the knowledge that evil lurked somewhere in the park. Many hikers started to group up into larger groups to ensure their safety. 
When this announcement was made, the acting park superintendent called it a isolated and unfortunate incident, and that they were looking into what had happened. Once this was announced to the public, there was a media frenzy about the details of the case. Many people believed this was a hate crime towards the LGBTQ plus community as the pair were lesbians, although this has never been confirmed as the motive. One of the main difficulties that investigators faced when looking into Julie and Laura's deaths was the fact that they had been murdered in a national park. Shenandoah National Park is under federal jurisdiction, meaning that only the federal government has law enforcement authority. This meant that the case was under multi-jurisdictional investigation, an investigation that included the FBI. This caused a degree of a power struggle within the investigation. The FBI posted out numerous information-seeking posters about the case, appealing for any information that could be used to close the case. They received hundreds of tips over the months that followed, but none of those tips led to any significant leads. One of the things that was recovered from the couple's campsite was a camera which the couple had been using to document their trip. This camera was extremely useful in trying to piece together what had happened in the lead up to the couple's deaths. All of the photos in the camera had date and time stamps, allowing the investigators to know exactly when the couple were at each photo location. The couple had hiked on the White Oak Canyon Trail, where Taj was previously found wandering alone. They had also climbed Hawksbill, which is the highest mountain in the park, before they'd come back down and settled to camp. The couple's whole backpacking trip was based upon the idea that they would rel relocate their camp every day as they continued their journey through the park. The last photo taken on this camera was during the day on the 24th of May 1996, a few hours before the couple were in the car with the ranger. For over a year, the murder case of Julie and Laura was cold. There were no new leads and it seemed like these women and their families would never get the justice they deserved. That was until one day in July 1997, over a year since Julie and Laura's deaths, the tranquility of Shenandoah National Park was shattered once again. On the 9th of June 1997, Yvonne Malbasha, a single mother from Canada, was on a cycling trip with one of her friends. They were cycling in the Skyline Drive area of Shenandoah Park, and she had been separated from her friends when she was nearly ran over and kidnapped. Yvonne was stalked along the road by a man in a blue Chevy pickup with no plates, who promptly forced her off the road. The man in question was Daryl David Rice. Daryl quickly got out of the car and threw a soda can at her before grabbing her chest and screaming, quote, Show me your titties. Can't believe I'd say that on camera. Daryl then tried to wrestle her into his truck, but she managed to get up and use her bike as a blockade from his attacks. The only other thing that she had to defend herself with was her water bottle, which she threw at him with all of her force. Yvonne was then able to fight Daryl off and took cover behind a tree as he stormed back to his car. Before driving off, Daryl had one final attempt at harming Yvonne, and attempted to run her over again. Luckily for Yvonne, the next motorist that she encountered on the road was a park ranger who pulled over to help her and call in the attack. This ranger relayed the description of the man and his pickup truck to the guards on the park's gates. In the time it took Daryl to get to the exit of the park, he had pulled over and put the plates back onto his car. The guards, though, apprehended Daryl as he attempted to leave and after searching his vehicle, they found hand and leg restraints hidden inside. It was obvious that he had planned to kidnap someone on this trip into Shenandoah Park. At this point in time, Daryl was in his late 20s and had recently been fired from his job for being, quote, extremely hostile at work. He was known to be a volatile person who talked down to his female co-workers as he believed they had lower intelligence than him. In 1998, Daryl pled guilty to the attempted abduction of Yvonne Mulbasha and was sentenced to 11 years in a federal penitentiary. Interviews that took place after his arrest for Yvonne's attempted abduction led prosecutors to believe that he may 
have been involved in the deaths of Judy Williams and Laura Winans. There was video evidence that showed Daryl entering the National Park at 8.05pm on May 25th and again at 4.57pm on May 26th, the exact same time frame that correlated with Julie and Laura's deaths. Daryl denied that he was in the park on those days despite this video evidence. In 1998, the FBI placed an undercover agent in the correction centre that Daryl was serving his sentence in. This agent taped their conversations, and Daryl stated that, quote, he was inadequate sexually, that he couldn't find a girlfriend, and that he substituted pornography for his sexual relationships. Daryl stated on several occasions that he enjoys assaulting women because they are, in his words, quote, more vulnerable than men. He also commented that Julianne Williams and Laura Winans, quote, deserved to die because they were lesbian whores. On the 26th of January 2001, Daryl tried to appeal his sentence in relation to the attempted kidnapping of Yvonne Malbasha, but on the 8th of February 2001, this appeal was declined. With the circumstantial evidence presented earlier on the 10th of April 2001, the indictment of Daryl David Rice in the murder of Judy Williams and Laura Winans was announced. His views on women's inferiority and his commentary against homosexuals led Daryl to become a prime suspect in the Williams and Winans case. And on the 10th of April 2002, Daryl David Rice was charged. Daryl was charged with four counts of capital murder. Two of those counts alleged that he had chosen the victims, Julie and Laura, based upon their sexual orientation. This meant that he was charged with a hate crime, and his indictment invokes a federal sentencing enhancement, meaning that he would be eligible to receive the death penalty. Daryl was known to be a misogynist, and he'd been quoted saying that women are, quote, more vulnerable than men, and that he hates gays. Unfortunately for the families of Julie Williams and Laura Winans, Dowell Rice was never sentenced on any of these charges. Even though prosecutors spent years building this case against Darrell, they lacked any actual physical or forensic evidence. This meant that the case against him was purely circumstantial. In October 2003, a hair that had been previously found at the Williams and Winans crime scene was tested for DNA. The DNA results threw the prosecution's case into a state of disarray. The DNA didn't match that of Darrell Rice, Julie Williams, or Laura Winans. Before October 2003, the only DNA the prosecutors had was DNA from the cloth restraints on Julie's wrists, which, when tested, came back as inconclusive. So, on the 25th of February 2004, the judge dismissed the four counts of capital murder charges against Darrell David Rice. As the murder of Julie and Laura is still an act of investigation, the FBI will not discuss persons of interest, and to this day, no one has been convicted for their murders. Dowell Rice was officially released from prison in 2011, and has been keeping a low profile ever since. In 2017, it was the 20th anniversary of Julie and Laura's murders, and we can only hope that their families have been able to find some kind of peace even without the knowledge of who committed this horrific act. Today, in 2021, Julie and Laura would have been 50 and 52 years old. Mrs. Williams, Julie's mother, plans hikes every year in her daughter's memory. Last time they did one, about 10 people walked with her, including several of her daughter's friends, in a quote, take back the trails movement. When asked about the walks, Mrs. Williams said, Quote, when dealing with grief, you try to find a positive outlet. This not only keeps Julie and Lolly's memory alive, it keeps attention on the case. Maybe it will spark someone's memory from last Memorial Weekend. If you have any information concerning the murder of Julianne Julie Williams or Laura Lolly Winans, please contact the FBI Richmond Division at 804 261 1044. Let me know what you think about this case in the comment section down below. Do you think that Daryl was truly responsible or do you think that it may have been somebody else? 
You can also let me know by sending a tweet to me or sending me an Instagram DM. My handle on both platforms is at it's Joshua Miles. I've started doing a case Q&A after every episode has gone live over on my Instagram stories. So follow me over there so you can take part in that and you don't miss out on that. Again, thank you so much to Magellan TV for sponsoring this episode. You can get your one month free trial by clicking the link at the top of the description or the link in the pinned comments. If you have a case that you want me to cover in an episode on this channel, you can send in your submissions on our dedicated website, requestacase.com. And with all that being said, I'll see you in the next case.